on Business Incorporated today. Pfizer's African partner produces first doses of COVID-19 shorts. Ghana consumer inflation rises to 33.9% in August. And Egypt to operate low-cost foreign flights. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Will Ibang. Let's begin as always with major equities from Africa where sentiments were mostly negative at intraday. Nigeria's NGX was the sole gainer, traded marginally up 0.01% at intraday, uh, while the South Africa's e e GSE dropped 0.68%. Elsewhere, e Egypt's EGX was also in the red down more than almost 1.8% at intraday, while the Nairobi Securities Exchange closed Tuesday's trading session also in negative territory. And in the Middle East is mostly negative sentiment as well at intraday. The Abu Dhabi and Dubai exchanges traded in opposite directions. The Abu Dhabi index was up marginally by 0.05%, while the Dubai index dropped 0.93%. And still within the region, Saudi Arabia and the Qatari indexes were in the red at intraday, both down more than 1%. Now to Europe, where the fate of a landmark 4.4 billion antitrust judgment against Google hangs in the balance as the European Union's top court rules on its legality. The EU found in 2018 that Google's use of its Android mobile operating system to push its search and other built-in apps was anti-competitive. A ruling is expected later today. Now, Stephen Beersley joins me from Berlin to share more about this. Stephen, should we be surprised by this ruling? Yeah, the ruling today by the EU's second top court essentially reaffirming the 2018 decision uh, by the EU Commission against Google. However, it did lower the fine from $4.4 billion to $4.1 billion. Uh, the court ruling in this case that uh, that amount better reflects the gravity and duration of Google's infringement. Now, remember, Google is accused in this case uh, or found guilty of, we should say, by the commission of making uh, anti-competitive requirements of device makers who wanted to use the Android OS, essentially requiring that they bake in um, certain uh, Google search apps uh, and making it hard for them to remove those apps. They found that that was anti-competitive. Um, is this uh, a surprise today? It's hard to say that if there were concrete expectations on either side. What we know is that the EU has won these types of appeals before. They've had them upheld. Uh, for example, just last year against Google in a in a very similar case involving Google's shopping service, uh, the court upheld a $2.4 billion fine in that case. But this year has been a different story. The EU Commission losing two high-profile cases against Intel uh, in January and then Qualcomm later in June, both similar cases involving $1 billion fines. Um, so in this case, uh, it, was a, it was an open question as to what was going to come out of this. So what does this verdict mean for Google and the EU? Yeah, it's definitely a win for the EU Commission after those uh, two prominent cases that I just mentioned. Uh, it's a reaffirmation of the fact that they were heading in the right direction, that they read the rules uh, properly. Um, but in uh, in many ways, it's it's moot because the EU, in the meantime, has passed uh, two laws, essentially, um, uh, the EU um, Digital Services Act and Digital Markets Act, um, that essentially cover this area now. And so it's not based on uh, a ruling by the EU Commission uh, that tech firms will be policed, but instead by the law of the land as EU members uh, begin to incorporate that into their national codes as well. Uh, but this has been approved at the EU level, um, and both of those would cover this area. Again, also, Google has made changes in the meantime to how its search functions are presented within its Android app and what it requires of device makers. So what are we looking out for European markets today? 
Yeah, European markets suffering the same fate as their counterparts in the U.S. and Asia after that uh, somewhat surprising inflation reading in the U.S. Of course, inflation uh, ticking slightly down the inflation rate, uh, but uh, prices rising in many areas. And so that changed a lot of the calculation that many investors had made to this point. And as a result, we saw, of course, the shock fall in the Dow uh, Jones Industrial uh, Average in the U.S. and then Asian markets also taking it pretty heavy on the chin. European markets uh, going the same direction, all starting out significantly lower uh, from Paris to London and here in Frankfurt as investors recalculate and reassess uh, what this trend of inflation looks like in the near term and in the long term. Mm, thanks so much, Stephen, for that update. Um, we'll keep track of that. And over to the UK, where the country's activities have slowed as Britons are still in a period of mourning. However, prices are still rising and house prices in particular in the UK have shot up to a 19-year high. Juliana Olayinka joins me from our London studio with more details on this. Hi, Juliana. How are you doing today? I'm good, Will. Thank you. Now, Juliana, average, average UK house prices rose by 15.5% in July, and that's a 19-year high. Juliana, it appears that it's a day of one record jump after another, isn't it? Well, yeah, we have had data from the Office for National Statistics this morning revealing uh, that if you want to purchase an average home in the United Kingdom today, you would be paying on average £292,000. That is a lot of money uh, for some of us. Um, and um, it does represent a £39,000 year-on-year increase. I think between months of June and July, house prices have increased by about £6,000. Now, economists have kind of, uh, you know, dug down into uh, the data and they say one of the reasons why we are seeing such a significant increase in the month of July, which represents, I believe, about a 7.8% jump, is because this time last year we saw the ending, well, the same period last year, we were seeing the ending of that stamp duty holiday. Now, stamp duty is an extra tax that anyone who buys a property would have to pay on top of what the, the, the average house price is or what the, the selling price is. Um, but because of um, the, the, the economic suffering from the COVID pandemic, the former Chancellor Rishi Shunak did decide to have a stamp duty holiday. We saw an influx of people uh, buying homes, particularly first-time buyers. But of course, that had an ex, uh, expiry date. And the expiry date was the end of June. Uh, so in July 2021, there wasn't much of a demand, which is why we are seeing uh, the significant increase. Also as well, um, we cannot forget inflation. We have had new data this morning showing that inflation dipped slightly uh, from 10.1% to 9.9%. But of course, 9.9% is still significantly high and that's affecting um, all sectors, which is why we are seeing such a huge increase in house pricing here. We did say, discuss this morning with Juliana about food prices rising higher and higher, and we're wondering how we're going to keep coping, Juliana. I was thinking of coming for a holiday, but I don't know. I'm thinking. <laughs> Maybe I'll change my mind. <laughs> Still come. Okay, you Juliana. can stay with me. I'll okay. cook for you. <laughs> okay, Juliana. Thanks so much. Um, how are markets looking, by the way, before we go up? Um, markets aren't doing um, great, actually, and I think there's the, it, the, there's a multitude of reasons. Some global. We also had pretty high data, didn't we, um, yesterday uh, from the U.S. Federal Reserve about their own inflation. Even though inflation in the U.K. is still uh, way higher uh, than any comparable economy, uh, the mood is still grim, as you said. We are going through um, a period of mourning. In fact, um, you know, the procession for uh, the late Her Majesty is about to begin any time now, where we will be seeing the royal family walk behind her coughing from Buckingham Palace to Westminster Hall, where she will be lying in state uh, for four days. I think that's kind of the, the mood in the UK at the moment, and it is being reflected in the markets. Uh, the FTSE All Share is down at intraday by 0.71%, the FTSE 100 down too by 0.65%, and the FTSE 250, the domestic market, is down by 0.49%. In currencies, the British pound is currently trading up against the US dollar by 0.61%, up to against the euro by 0.16%, and down on the Japanese yen at intraday by 0.35%. Well, Thanks so much, Juliana, for the update. And do have, uh, I don't know if it's going to be a restful day, but you have a lot of work to do, and kudos to that.
And now shares in the Asia Pacific dropped sharply on Wednesday after indexes on Wall Street plunged following a higher than expected U.S. Consumer Price Index report for August. Japan's Nikkei 225 dropped 2.7 percent and the Topics Index fell 2 percent. The Hang Seng Index in Hong Kong dipped 2.55 percent and the Hang Seng Tech Index fell 2.96 percent. While in Australia, we saw the S&P ASX 200 drop 2.58 percent to close at 6,828 points. Now, the KOSPI in South Korea lost 1.34 percent, and mainland China's Shanghai Composite lost 1.02 percent. Moving on to U.S., where stock futures traded higher early on Wednesday after another hot inflation reading sent the major averages tumbling to their worst days since June 2020 and dampened investors' expectations of a less hawkish Federal Reserve. Futures tied to the Dow Industrial Average last added 0.32 percent, while S&P 500 futures ticked 0.43 percent higher, and Nasdaq 100 futures gained 0.49 percent. Now, let's have a quick take on yesterday's trade and activity with our correspondent, Maria Bird. The U.S. stock market suffered greatly on Tuesday, having its worst day since June of 2020. The Dow Jones was down by 3.94 percent, the S&P 500 down by 4.32 percent, and the heavy tech Nasdaq was down by 5.16 percent. This is all in response to what came out in the August inflation report, which stated that inflation was still high in the U.S., one of its highest has been in several months. This allowed the Federal Reserve to state that they will be having a more aggressive approach on interest rate increases, which will have a dramatic impact on the U.S. stock market, despite the hope that it will decrease inflation. But this will be a long road for the U.S. stock market, and many investors are skeptical that the market will not recover anytime soon. Now, oil prices inched higher. Thanks, Maria, for that uh, update. Well, oil prices inched higher in the early trade on Wednesday as OPEC stock to forecast for robust global fuel demand growth, upsetting concerns of another U.S. Federal Reserve interest rate hike next week after consumer prices unexpectedly rose in August. Brent crude futures rose three cents to $93.20 a barrel after settling 0.9% lower on Tuesday. U.S. Tex West Texas intermediate crude was at $87.41 a barrel, up 0.1%. The Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, OPEC, on Tuesday reiterated forecasts for growth in global oil demand in 2022 and 2023, citing signs that major economies were faring better than expected despite headwinds such as surging inflation. Oil demand will increase by 3.1 million barrels per day in 2022 and by 2.7 million barrels per day in 2023, OPEC said in its monthly report. Now, gold prices edged lower early on Wednesday after hotter-than-expected U.S. inflation data boosted the dollar and expectations that the Federal Reserve will continue an aggressive policy tightening path. Spot gold prices fell 0.2 percent to 1,698.14. 1,698 dollars 14 cents per ounce. U.S. consumer prices unexpectedly, as I mentioned earlier, rose in August and underlying inflation accelerated amid rising costs for rent and health care, giving the Fed ammunition to deliver a third 75 basis points interest rate hike next Wednesday. Spot silver dipped 0.2 percent to $19.29 per ounce. Platinum edged 0.3 percent higher to $880.67 per ounce, and palladium fell 1% to $2,083.18. Now, after a break, a look at Zambia's new IMF deal and that conversation right around the corner. Do stay with us. This is Business Incorporated. Welcome back. Zambia has finally secured a zero-interest loan of $1.3 billion with a grace period of five and a half years and a final maturity of 10 years from the International Monetary Fund, IMF. The new extended credit facility arrangement for Zambia aims to help restore macroeconomic stability and foster higher, more resilient and more inclusive growth in the country. Gianmarco Capati, senior analyst Fitch Solutions, joins me from London to dissect the implications of the new deal and how beneficial 
official it is to Zambia. Hi, Mark. Uh, John Marco, it's good to have you on Hello. the program. Thank you for having me. John <laughs> uh, Marco, Zambia has finally, as I mentioned, secured this $1.3 billion uh, zero interest loan from the IMF. However, when we look at the terms and conditions that were set by the international financial institution, we're wondering, is this a good deal? Is it a good deal? I mean, it's a, it's a loan that comes with its conditions. Um, in, in one way, that makes sense. The government has to do reforms that will allow it to sort of stand on its legs uh, when the programme ends. Otherwise, the programme is just temporarily delaying issues. Uh, but let's be clear right away, the IMF doesn't always get it right, doesn't always uh, get programmes right in Africa. We do think this one's a net positive. The Zambia's economy is really doing two, three crucial things. Uh, the first one is it's providing much needed uh, external financing for the country. Uh, which has lacked, uh, which it has lacked over the last couple of years. And uh, this will allow the government to sort of do fiscal consolidation, but not really uh, having to implement really sharp uh, spending cuts. The government has been relying on domestic borrowing for a few years now. Uh, it can continue doing so because that comes with a higher interest cost and eventually reduces room for non-interest expenditure. Second thing is about confidence, really. We've seen investor confidence improve a lot since the election of the new government. Uh, last year in August, uh, and the staff level approval of the program back in December, and um, more recently the executive board approval uh, of the of the program has contributed to that. Uh, the, the the country's currency, the kwacha, has been strengthening. That uh, kept a lead on import costs at a time when uh, prices are rising, so ensuring that uh, Zambia's inflation has generally continued to slow this year, so easing pressure on consumers. And I think. The third thing it does is it will channel more funding from bilateral and multilateral partners mm -hmm. and speed up debt negotiations with uh, foreign creditors, which uh, are ongoing. That will ultimately further ease the burden of interest payments. So the government will have to contain total spending growth and reduce deficits, but will actually uh, be able to spend more of its resources on non-interest uh, categories of expenditure that actually have an impact uh, on the economy in the coming years. As you mentioned earlier, we're beginning to see some of the impacts or the benefits of this loan by the strengthening of the kwacha and all. But we also reminded that uh, Zambia was one of the countries, the first countries that was that defaulted in its debt, you know, after the, during the post-COVID era. But uh, do you think that shifting from public spending to recurrent spending is the best way to go for Zambia? Yes, yeah, so we will see a shift back to recurrent spending, uh, away from infrastructure spending, mm -hmm. uh, if compared to the years preceding the uh, country's default in late 2020. Uh, but those were exceptional years. Um, we saw a lot of inf infrastructure spending by the previous government, which eventually caused problems. Uh, so the IMF program is not really going to change much of what we've seen uh, since the country's default. Uh, the government has had to uh, cut capital expenditure uh, uh, for more than two years now, since 2020, because of lack of access to external funding. So we think the extent of those cuts would have been much bigger without IMF funding and potentially debt restructuring uh, progress in the coming quarters. It's also worth qualifying the statement about recurring expenditure. Uh, so yes, that's usually viewed as less productive way of uh, spending, uh, but the government will still be cutting on costly fuel subsidies, which are deemed uh, inefficient and harming the poorest, uh, while prioritizing spending on social security and crucially uh, health and education those tend to contribute to what we call uh, human capital which is mm. just as important as physical capital and tends to kind of lack in many ssa uh, countries tend uh, lead into sort of a low skill labor force so within within recurrent spending the government uh, it seems like it, it will be prioritizing categories that have a positive impact on the economy over the long term so all told we don't really think the terms of this specific loan for zambia uh, uh, unusually harmful. Now, still dwelling on the infrastructure projects, China has been Zambia's major development partner in this regard. And with this new IMF deal, the country is bound to take a back seat. It's probably going to take a back seat. How uncertain, what uncertainty do you think can possibly arise from this for ex existing and future projects? Um, so yes, so even that's true. Even in this case, though, the IMF deal doesn't really change the trend we've seen in recent years. Not only in Zambia, but many other African countries, where on the Chinese part, there's been more reluctance to fund uh, really big projects that have a um, clear economic return. Uh, in Africa, we've seen some project cancellation. For example, the additional phase of uh, Kenya's standard gauge railway, uh, which has been cancelled. Uh, so China's kind of focusing more on. Uh, 
financially viable projects, uh, smaller projects doing this for years. Uh, the amount of loans extended to African government has been falling for several years, peaking in 2016. If we exclude Angola, actually that, that amount peaked back in 2013. Uh, on the domestic side, uh, there's been more pressure in, in Africa on governments to take on uh, less uh, uh, Chinese credit given the uh, ballooning debt of recent, of recent years, particularly since the COVID-19 pandemic. So on both sides, we, we, we have already seen this kind of uh, more reticent, uh, selective approach to, to projects. Uh, the IMF program obviously reinforces this trend because it, it reinforces fiscal consolidation. But this does not necessarily mean that China will take a backseat uh, or that some other country will be able to really replace uh, its role in, in Africa and, and France. I think China will likely remain main source of funding for projects. It's just that funding will be lower overall uh, and more selective in, in the coming years compared to the past. So you think this is, you, you mentioned that this is going to extend to other African countries that are termed to be in debt distress, you know, distressed by debt at the moment. Do you think this is going to permeate maybe anyone looking to have a deal with the IMF? Is this going to be the same uh, terms and conditions they're going to have to face? Similar, yes. I mean, the approval of an IMF program does not necessarily collide with Chinese interests, and China is unlikely to view IMF programs as a direct threat. Uh, Chinese and IMF lending have coexisted for, for years. Uh, fiscal consolidation is actually always a key condition attached to IMF loans. Uh, so it's, been, it's been the case in the past. It's going to be uh, similar terms are going to apply to other countries. Um, the approval of the IMF program for Zambia, for example, uh, means that bilateral creditors can now move on to agree the exact terms of debt restructuring for the country, and China is the largest of those creditors. So if a country owes you money, knowing that the IMF is providing critical funding to that country can actually be good news. Uh, the program comes with conditions of reducing spending on lots of Chinese-funded projects. It's going to be the same for other countries. But as we said, uh, we believe China's already kind of realized the risks of funding big projects that end up fueling public debt in debt to countries uh, and has been scaling down support for a while. We do think the IMF is going to engage more with African countries in the coming in the coming uh, quarters, we've seen more pro more programs this year. So not only Zambia, but Tanzania, Mozambique, Benin. The next one could be Gambia, uh, Ghana. Um, we think that similar terms will apply, but we again we don't really think that will change or alter an otherwise different trend uh, or, or approach uh, from China. China's already been sort of downsizing uh, support for these countries. Thanks so much, Jan Marco Capati, Senior Analyst, Fish Solutions, for sharing your thoughts and perspective on the matter with us. Thanks again. Thank you. Now, consumer inflation in Ghana has hit a 21-year high just weeks after the largest lending rate hike in the country's history, and that's according to Ghana's Statistics Service. The country's Statistics Service says the Consumer Price Index rose for a 15th straight month to 33.9% year-on-year in August, from 31.7% in July. The hike in inflation rates can be attributed to continued surge in imported goods and also fueled by a slide in the CD. Now, South Africa's partly state-owned vaccine producer, the BioVac Institute, has produced its first batch of COVID-19 vaccines as part of an arrangement under which it aims to fill and package as many as 100 million doses a year of Pfizer, Incorporated, and BioNTech SE's inoculation. According to the chief executive officer of BioVac, Morena Makone, the doses which were produced last week are the first Pfizer COVID-19 shots to be made in Africa and will be evaluated by the South African Health Regulatory Products Authority before subsequent batches are planned for commercial sale next year. The arrangement with Pfizer is part of a response by global pharmaceutical companies, including Moderna Incorporated and Johnson & Johnson, to criticisms that they did little to help poor countries during the worst days of the corona pandemic. South Africa. Egypt says it's planning to operate low-cost foreign flights to boost tourism in the country. This comes in lights to dwindling uh, natural gas supplies to many European countries during the coming winters as one of the repercussions of the Russian-Ukraine war. According to the spokesman of the Egyptian cabinet, Nadel Sahed, stressed that the decision is not difficult to implement and that the government, through the civil aviation ministry and the concerned authorities, will start chartering planes and using them to operate low 
low-cost flights. He points out that the plan will lead to an increase in the number of incoming flights to Egypt. Saad says tourists in other countries will be able to use an electronic application for booking a flight and choosing the hotel in which they will accommodate with no need for tour operators and tourism com companies. And that's it on Business Incorporated. Thanks for watching. See you tomorrow.